We are now going to the next presentation. The Festival of Art History has a new session for the very last day. And I hope you've had ample time to attend other conferences this afternoon. Uh, we have our international avant-garde and back to the folklore arts, Cobra, presented by Nika Orna. And the conference will include a Q&A session after the presentation. You can put any question. I will hand over the mic. This is this conference is recorded, so we want everyone to hear. So you can you'll have the opportunity to exchange. So the floor is yours, madam. Thank you. Good morning, uh, and thank you all for coming here this day, this rainy day. Uh, and I also would like to thank, of course, Ian Shah for inviting me to and also actually command me to make this uh, paper on COBRA. Uh, so I will talk at, at around half an hour, and then I hope maybe we can have some discussion. Um, today, as artists are searching for a proper answer and position towards political powers, uh, towards dark times, uh, questions of peace, questions of climate, uh, and also about matters of how to include a more global outreach when it comes to uh, art history. Uh, it is worthwhile to look back, of course, to earlier examples of art artistic po positioning uh, of similar uh, character. Co Cobra is such an, an instance. Mm -hmm. The artists group Cobra, founded in 1948 by Asker Jorn, Karel Appel, Constant, Corneille, Christian d'Autremont, and Joseph Noiret in the Café Notre Dame in Paris, where they signed their manifesto La Cause Ete Entendue, uh, we, which we will get back to. Thus, Cobra emerged on a post war sensitivity and was marked by a devotion to artistic freedom, to spontaneity, as well as to revolutionary and Marxist ideals. The Cobra artists' answer to the terrors of the war was anchored in the belief of the fusion of art and life and in international cooperation. The name of the group, as I suppose you all know, was formed by the name of the home cities of the forming artists, Copenhagen, Brussels, Amsterdam. And it also points at their focus of interest, uh, transnational artistic interaction cooperations. But also the word cobra and, uh, connects to uh, the interest of man's relation to wild nature, to beasts, and to fettered uh, natural powers. So in this short lecture, I will uh, try to frame a little bit uh, the work of COBRA uh, the, and uh, investigate the, these ideas of international cooperation and transnational action, and uh, also position their art in a new moment when abstraction occurred simultaneously, but framed, was framed differently in East and in West. It will also, with respect to the theme of the Preston Festival, pay a special visit to the work of the Danish artist Asger Jorn, who, whom after the Cobra Group was dissolved in 1951, founded uh, uh, the Citronist International together with Guy Dupour. Uh, but what I will more emphasize on here today is um, uh, the early 1960s project of his, an ambition and large project uh, called 10,000 Years of Nordic Folk Art, which was meant to be a cooperation between himself as an artist and academic scholars. He collected and to a part published a collection of images of stone sculpture from the 12th century from southern Sweden uh, that had an expression which in Jorn's mind emerged from the Scandinavian people. 
His contention was that Nordic art was created by a free and undisciplined man that existed only in Scandinavia. Um, we all know that already, don't we? Uh, from the earliest times, and was based on his, also, his thought was also based on a dissymmetrical structure as opposed to other art. Thus, he contributed to the Cold War era culture with a work that served to widen the somewhat binary constructed art history of the post-war era. But we will come back to this project by, by in the second half of the lecture. <coughs> The art world of the post-war period was marked um, by the Cold War, of course, and of the famed moment when New York stole the ideas of modern art from Paris, in Serge Gilbert's words, and in his, from his famous book. In the summer of 1964, as Bob Rauschenberg achieved the Golden Lion Prize, prize in Venice at the Biennale. This was a result of the Americans uh, being pos um, have the possibility and the, the idea to support a young generation, while France staked to launch their uh, more established artists. Also, American popular culture was informing Europe, of course, and art exhibitions supported by American authorities were circulating and touring in Europe, also to Scandinavia. From the perspective of the northern countries, countries with their neutral politics during the war, paired with their closeness to the Eastern Bloc at the other side of the Baltic Sea, there was a strong uh, attention strongly felt. The arrival of American pop in Europe took place in Scandinavia with the first European Museum exhibition of the moment in the Moderna Museet in 1964. Uh, uh, by, by, by many seen and interpreted as a new opening of art and a turn to the West. And this will be returned to in a program point at two o'clock this afternoon on a round table. This somewhat divided world, heavily dichotomized by then and in the narratives of art history, need to be re-examined and relativized as it is, as is now also being done in several Scandinavian scholarly projects as well as and in, uh, projects like such as each is, um, projects such as own reality led by Professor Mathilde Arnaud at um, RDR uh, and at the Centre Allemand Histoire de l'Art. So to the Cobra history. Oscar John has fo had founded Hell Hesten, the Hell Horse, during the occupation of Denmark. The group included Elsa Alfred, Sonja Ferlo Mankoba, Henry Hirup, Egil Jacobson, Ernest Mankoba. And they shared an interest in local folk, folk art as well as the legacy of surrealism in defiance of their anti modernist German occupiers. With the inclusion of Ernest Mankoba, a South African artist that had come to, to Paris in 1938 on a scholarship to study at Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Arts Décoratifs, uh, where he met his future wife, Danish artist Sonia Ferlo. Uh, me, th me, that inclusion meant that uh, a rare exception of overseas and non-European artist coalitions and cooperation were, was created. Uh, that uh, what is still uncommon, but was very much uncommon then. And um, uh, Mankova was a British subject, and due to that, he was imprisoned during the German occupation of France. Uh, uh, but he, after the war, he and Furlow went to Denmark and connected to the Copra group there. Uh, his African Madonna, which I show here to the Right, it's in a very interesting example, I believe, of transracial statements regarding the Westerners within the history of Western art, and it's an early example from 1929. So, as any uh, good avant-garde group, there must be a manifest or a program, and this is the one that was signed uh, at 48, and I have it just in French. Uh, and maybe I hope that will be good enough for this audience. I'm sorry I didn't have it in English uh, in one of my PowerPoint. Um, the name of the manifesto was a play on the title of a previous document 
uh, of a breakaway group of Belgian and French surrealists that they had written in 1947 with, with the title La Cause est entendue. Asker Jorn and Christian Dautremont were members of this group. They had met at the 1947 uh, uh, revolutionary surrealism meeting, so the manifesto's title had a deeper meaning for them, which was to point out Cobra's members' criticism of traditional surrealism, uh, especially Breton. Asker Jorn uh, were th there. A uh, version of um, of um, of surrealism was uh, m more Marxist informed uh, as well, and you can see also the way of anger, the way of statement that you read in this uh, in this program against the state of the arts and the state of the world in a way. So it's a very very powerful uh, program. Uh, but also very, very typical uh, as uh, a, a, a kind of neo-avant-garde gesture. So after having signed their program in Paris, the artists started to circulate in Europe, in Europe, publishing magazines, making small exhibitions, traveling with small men to meet and develop ideas, work collectively, doing work, also painterly work together, to, uh, collectively. Within the context of Cobra, uh, the, this group was from this point growing, so more and more people, more and more artists uh, uh, were included in the group. They were helping each other and uh, constantly uh, uh, discussing ideas, oh, although it was just during a very short period of time that the, that the group held together. Um, Excuse me. To make some uh, um, examples of the work in this context, we can't do the whole chronolo chronology. I will uh, first show you this very famous uh, work, which was uh, doing, uh, made in cooperation between Ascarion and Christian Dautremont just before uh, Cobra was, signed, was founded. Uh, il y a plus de choses dans la terre d'un tableau que dans le ciel de la théorie esthétique. And of course, this is also very clearly a dialogue, uh, both with uh, the present time, the war times, the political situation, and the, the heavily um, discussion of arts and formalism and new forms of abstraction that was going on, both in the European version of neo avantgardism and in the American uh, avant-gardeism. And it's also, as you all understand, a, a very strong statement against theory, against um, words, uh, but for images and for paintings. So this is a very typical exam example of that. Uh, and it's a kind of icon work for the Cobra history. Another example uh, which gives an insight in the kind of work they did was the way they managed to uh, convince um, uh, the director Sandberg at Stedelijk exhibition to to uh, open some spaces for a big show in 1949. And here is the, this very famous image where they all, again, young, poor artists coming personally with their paintings under more or less under their arms. I think this is a very much a stage photo, of course, as you all see, but still this is the idea, we're coming where art, we go directly into the museum and put it out on the wall. And um, <clears throat> all the, this uh, show, to my mind, is both uh, this double standard of both sort of embrace the institution, uh, make an effort to have a space there and to exhibit there, but also to criticize the exhibition. And it is also a very interesting example of, of new ways of um, exhibiting, of ex exhibition design, ex exhibition constructions. Uh, because even though they came with works, they also, some of them made um, artworks directly on the wall that were sort of uh, uh, Co um, 
sh presented in connect together with the smaller works that they had with them. And uh, it's a very famous architect uh, called Aldo van Dyck, who was the designer of the whole show. Uh, and it's very interesting and fun to read about the opening, where the audience uh, constantly hear the drums of, of, of African, African, African drums, because this group was very interested in, in, this, in different kind of ingenious art. Uh, it was not, uh, though, um, lively played, but, but it was recorded. And also, <clears throat> uh, including in this show was a room where poetry was mounted on the walls, a black room, including also quotation from Lenin and other politicians. Dr. Amor held an opening address where he talked about the members of the healthiest and most honest artists of today. This is Cobra, presenting the interest uh, uh, in formalism in press and painting as an equal to Hiroshima, the bomb in Hiroshima, uh, where everything human has uh, has been erased. So they kind uh, kind of developing an a way of art where they, of course, use also abstraction, but they want this human content and to, to um, address humanity. A few days after the opening, a fight took place during a poetry reading in the exhibition where the audience protest, protest against the seemingly artless and provocative manners uh, of, the, of the poets' poems and the speeches held. Uh, and there was an actually fight, actual fight. And the, this uproar also was kind of partly the end of the, 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 the cobra, more or less. But it also is, I believe, a very typical way of how you, produce, how you um, provoke the institution, the audience, in a, ma in a manner that could uh, be compared with the futurists, maybe, from the early avant-garde even though they have a com completely different ideas. And there are other examples of how, how the institution is um, criticized. Uh, this is a famed telegram from Oscar Jon to Harry Guggenheim, the director of the Guggenheim Museum by the time. Uh, he was chosen uh, to have a, a very, very important prize of $2,500. Uh, among four other artists, the others were Vasarely, Wilfredo Lam, Antonio Tapies, Robert Motherwell. Uh, if you read uh, the statement by Harry Guggenheim uh, in uh, New York Times, he says that he has no idea why he refused to have it. Uh, there were no explanation to this, and this is uh, it was outrageous. Outrageous! It's the first time it happens. But of course, he knew why, because this is very much criticized of the capitalist system and of the museum. It is very clear, argumented here, why he declines the prize. So, and here we have, of course, a strong connection to the conceptual artists of the 60s in America, Hans Hacke and others, who constantly were inside the institution, but also sort of uh, fighting with it. Yeah. Uh, of another very clear uh, gesture of um, reenactment of the neo avant garde is, of course, within the work itself by Oscar Jorn, who during uh, uh, a period made um, copies of of famous art pieces, but remaking them, painting other words on it. Uh, and it's an, a note to my eyes, an act of destruction, of course, but uh, it's a little bit like a love, love affair still, uh, that you, you see, we still need the avant-garde and we need to, to love them and to, to remake them and to reenact them and make them important for today's time. So it's great, it, it's great work. So to sum up a little bit of the ideas of, Co of Cobra here is that um, it, you could use the words by uh, Pierre Alejinsky, um, the Belgian artist, 
Uh, COBRA, it is, a it is a spontaneity, a total opposition to the calculation of cold abstraction, to the mis miser miserabilist or optimistic speculation of socialist uh, realism, to all forms of discrepancy between the free thought and the action of painting freely. It is also an international opening and a desire for the de-specialization because obviously there were both poets and painters in the group and the, the poets were painting and the painters were, were writing poems, so they were open up, so. so. Uh, now, we would go, go a little bit into the project of this project, Scandinavian Institute of Comparative Vandalism by Oscar Jorn. For John, internationalism meant solidarity amongst those who were kept out of classical culture. He had, as I said, interest in art of ingenious uh, culture. In the late 1950s, he began working on this project, uh, and uh, he had uh, uh, published together with his brother, Jorgen Nash, uh, in the magazine Drakabygget in 1962, um, uh, the program of the, of the Scandinavian vandalism. And uh, the magazine's full name was Magazine for Art Against Atom Bombs, Popes, and Politicians, which indicates the ideal framework of the political content. In the magazine, he lined out uh, uh, also the project that he was about to head on. Uh, it was to, to sort of announce a Scandinavian Institute of Comparative Vandalism is, of course, to a part an ironic gesture. Uh, however, the project, the project was taken seriously by Jorn. He was very interesting in actually interpreted Scandinavia's history in the same way that, that um, other kinds of investigation of historical uh, heritage has been made. So the intention was not... Uh, it was very ambitious. It was to create an alternative art history through an encyclopedia in 32 volumes covering Nordic folk art. So he was gathering tens of thousands of photographs uh, that are today archived in Copenhagen, in the Oscar Jorn archive. Oh no, it's outside of Copenhagen, sorry. And it was published just in this volume, there, there was just one of those 32 actually printed. Uh, he named, uh, the photographer was to mostly uh, Gerard, Frances Gerard Franceschi. And um, uh, you see to the right um, a, a contact sheet. Uh, I have this material from Modana Museum who made uh, an, uh, a little archival pro, uh, exhibition of this, by the, created by Henrik Andersson uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and because in early summer 1964, Oscar Jones set off for Gotland, you know, the big island in the Baltic Sea, on a self-assigned mission, renting a farm at the southern part of the island. The aim was to create one of those 32 volumes titled Stone and and bone about Gotland. During the summer also he and his colleagues ph photographed uh, um, the very rich uh, Romanian culture there is on Gotland uh, the, the, where they have like over 150 cathedrals or churches within a very small uh, uh, geographic area. So the medie medieval heritage on Gotland is very, very rich uh, as it also used to be a Hansastadt. When Oscar Jones is uh, in this publication making a very interesting and very intelligently well, well written note about the project, we can follow a little bit his thought and the ideas that he was doing. Um, he was referring to a Danish artist called Girsing, uh, saying, Good art is always universal, universal art is always bad. Uh, his attack towards what he calls cosmopolitanism the claim of the European amateur guard to be universal is important here. Jorn identifies the Nordic art, 
meaning the medieval art of Scandinavia as being of a double nature, European and non-European at the same time. He recognizes the risk of either identity. If one chooses to use the European standards of value scale, this art would remain, and I quote, a subordinated peripheral, peripheral art within an art historical development that has its center in the Mediterranean areas. On the, hand, uh, on the other hand, says Jorn, if one takes the opposite stand of evaluating this art as an isolated or independent art, like an island uh, of the Nordic countries, it could be viewed as simply a poor presentation, a fraud at worst. I quote, we need to remain, uh, we need to continue to view this in its tension between the universal, the Nordic and the European throughout our description. So this sounds partly as uh, uh, some of the ideas that are forming today's global art history or maybe the concept of horizontal art history as, as it has been launched by the Polish art historian Piotr Piotrowski. Uh, but, how, but is it really the, the full idea? If we continue to, to read uh, Asker John, he claims that the terminology of art history is based on literary historicism. The classical history writing is the base of today's chronicles. Thus, uh, Nordic art is first described in Lat Latin by the Greek and the Romans. In that perspective, the Nordic art is a poorer version of the Southeast art history and of Oriental art, of course, with no influence on the global art development. But John points out that even though one must agree that there are certain uh, radiation centers, to those of you who, knows, who know Scandinavian or the Danish, he used the word utstrålning centrum, which is a very funny and interesting concept, radiation centers, affects the developments of art, there must be other way of describing this work, this modern work, than this. So during, as, as we all know, during the 19th century, the national state emerged as an alternative base for history writing, and the center-periphery relation was pointed out between the capital and the province within each nation. Joint claims that the classical history understanding is not applicable on this art as it is completely ahistoric and must be replaced by uh, archaeology history views as well as what he calls artistic views. So the occasional connection uh, between this art and the literary historical narrative places the Nordic art in a strange half-light, John, John says, where fragments occur now and then, leaving the spectator to fantasies over the rests. These are the circumstances within which these books take departure. John's suggestion and solution of those problems is an ordering of the objects according to types, repetition, and singularity of forms that is the archaeological uh, approach. This need further on, according to John, be completed with the artistic standpoint. The, archaeolo the, ar the archaeologist is systematizing his empirical base to explain the deeper historical depth, while the aim of the art book, this project, is to represent the artistic value and its estate in itself by the juxtaposition of through photos. Uh, works by from different sites and different moments in times. So in the book itself, you, you have subtitles in the back of the book where you can know, know exactly from what church those images are. But in the, in the body of the book, you just have the images because he wants us to read them just simply visually. So he, so he wanted to, to work together with scientists and did to, uh, that also to a very small extent, though, uh, and add himself a pure artistic approach. Um, and his, but still, as you all know, if you do some research and work with art, you come to a moment where you self have to categorize in order to not just create a chaos or something that is not 
possible to understand. So in Jorn's case, he first uh, ordered those 10,000 uh, or ten, uh, many 10,000 of uh, photographs. He first ordered them with as panor panoramic pictures. The second point was images from prehistorical times uh, after principle of motives. And then the third was still biblical motives in the order of the biblical narrative after Panofsky in a way, and the fourth, more random connected to biblical, biblical heroes and tales, and finally, the classical image of the one big cathedral in Sweden, which is the one in Lund. This means, he says, that the series ends with the motives that the classical historian normally would put in the beginning, so there is a prehistory here. To summarize a bit, uh, one can, of course, view Jones, Jones' project, Scandinavian Institute of Comparative Vandalism, uh, in connection to other attempts of defining a non-linear art history, as uh, obviously Abby Warburg's Atlas Mnemosyn, created from 1927 in Hamburg, an immense collection of images that he investigated exclusively on the basis of the visuality of the image or project. These images and, and Warburg's book collection is now in the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek in London. In that project, the moment of memory is important. Uh, and also, um, uh, he was using it himself, Warburg, to, to, as a working material when he was traveling uh, to different sites. He could, keep, he could keep his history with him through these photos. He also rearranged them several times on panels in different orders. Um, Jorn's project, however, differs from the one of Warburg, that in uh, um, that the, Warburg had the ambition to make a global art history. It was never finalized, but it, well, that was uh, his big idea, to, to find the, the common thread of art on the globe. Uh, we can also, and that was not what Jorn was doing, as we already has uh, commented upon. We can also re relate um, John's project to André Malraux at Le Musée Imaginaire, uh, or his essay on, uh, from 1947. There he proposes to replace the museum with its roots in the Renaissance with the imaginary museum of the mind, but also made possible through the photographic documentation. After all, it is a fantastic thing to be sitting on one spot and be able to compare uh, artworks from different sites and different times. But in Jorn's museum, or Institute of Scandinavian Vandalism, however, the Scandinavian people were not part of community, but emerged from a free and undisciplined people or man. So he was really launching some, kind, some other thing here. So in this project, 10,000 Years of Nordic Folk Art, Jorn, as a true cobra artist, merged the interest of internationalism with the true belief of a specific national, of, spe of the importance of specific uh, national roots. I don't know, but this can maybe uh, give ideas both to art historians in order how uh, in the, we in the future develop our research, but not the least to artists in these very hard times we are living in. And, and the, time, the hard times we are confronting to a large consent. Thank you. <laughs> so if you had any questions, I would be happy to ask them. To, to Thank ask you them. very much. Merci beaucoup. Est-ce que quelqu'un a une question? Thank you very much. Uh, a question in the audience? wondering if Asker Jorn, when he worked on these um, beautiful photographs, still kept on painting? Or was it something that he totally stopped after the 50s when he saw it's kind of a capitalistic system and he doesn't fit in? I, I do believe he continued to work in different media, uh, but he was also very much bitter in the, in the end of his life towards the European art market. and. When he died in 73 in Denmark, he decided to get bar buried, not in, in there, but on Gotland. So I added this. This is his graveyard and his sculpture on, on his grave. He wanted to be there among the other 
uh, vandalists, <laughs> the Scandinavian vandalists. So that is maybe a sign that he was sort of really leaving the, the uh, European concept of, of art in his hand. Une autre question? Any other questions? Well, I think that we can conclude your conference. Thank you very much.